Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, welcome back to another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. Today joining me is Katrina Mick-Alexander, who is the owner-operator of Mountain View Orchards in Mount Hood, Oregon. For over 100 years, they have raised top-grade environmentally sustainable fruit, establishing the farm as an important fruit grower in the Hood River Valley. They also offer on-farm events, you pick, and have established a hard cider, wine, and their latest innovation is a brewery, which opens in just a few weeks. Welcome. Thank you. Excited to be here. So you've got a lot going on. Talk to us a little bit more about the overview of the farming operation. Yes. So we are one of, you know, the very few small family farms in the Hood River Valley. And here, small family farms have kind of been on the decline because of just economic challenges, trade agreement changes, climate change, and just the sustainability of farms is getting Mm -hmm. more difficult. So one of the things that I've been really committed to, to continue our way of farming right here for the last three generations, is coming up with innovative ideas and aggressively diversifying the farm so we can invite people to come experience our farm and basically maintain our way of life here in Mount Hood, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what's your background? How did you get started farming? So I grew up right here on this farm that I bought from my parents five years ago. Um, So I spent my summers helping, you know, pick strawberries and harvesting fruit. I, you know, some of my first jobs were changing pipes and, Sending off little fruits. Uh, my first, my very first job was working for my grandfather, picking strawberries for him starting in June in Oregon. And then um, when I graduated from high school, I really felt committed to carrying on our small family farm. So I intentionally went to school to become a nurse and then a nurse practitioner. Okay. And at age 22, age 23, I started saving about $200 a month. And then when I got to about the age of 36, after working as a full-time nurse practitioner, I had enough to come back and buy the, my family's farm. Very cool. So, so I still work a day or two a week as a nurse practitioner here in our local county jail clinic because there's just a need for compassionate care there. Mm-hmm. And I still kind of need that income, to be honest with you. I still have to work a bit off the farm to make all my payments. But um, my heart and my my soul has been, I've just been pouring it all into my family third generation farm since I got here in about the end of 2014. Mm -hmm. So over those hundred years, I'm sure the focus and what they were uh, growing changed a bit. Yeah. So when my grandparents first met, fell in love and moved here, they're educators. So they taught in the local high school here. And they just started buying 10 acres here and 15 acres here and primarily apple and pear orchards. And yeah, the Hood River Valley has had a big kind of shift in what it's growing because it originally it was mostly primarily apples, but then they wow. had like a huge freeze, like a huge freeze around the 1930s, 1940s. And then they started primarily planting pears because they were just a little bit hardier during our uh-huh. winters. But, you know, the beauty of this area is that there's five different microclimates. So it's just you can grow a variety of things really well. Uh And then we have the six feet of the volcanic loam soil from Mount Hood erupting way back in the day. Uh So the soil is really dense and rich. And then also because of Mount Hood, we have this ample source of irrigation water. So we have, you know, endless water which is a huge deal. You know, there's farmers all over the country that are, you know, going through water shortages. So we always feel incredibly grateful that we have this source of water so we can grow. Because we grow fruits, veggies, we grow um, tree fruit, we grow flowers, we, um, we have culinary herbs. We have a variety of things because we have a farm-to-table restaurant. 
So a lot of that fruit, veggies, culinary herbs, and then all of the, you know, fermentation, like the grapes, uh-huh. the cider, you know, that all goes and is served on site at our, um, at our farm to table restaurant. Interesting. So the, talk to me about the weather. Is that something where Mount Hood brings in more rain or is the water that you can access under the ground and just pumping it out? Yeah. Um, so there's four seasons here. And okay. um, so we definitely have like, it snowed a little bit this morning and, you know, we need that snowpack because the snowpack uh, from Mount Hood comes down through three forks. There's three hood forks of the Hood River that come off Mount Hood. And we are, our farm is literally flanked by the middle fork of okay. the Hood River. So that's where we pull our irrigation from. Um, so we definitely, I wouldn't say that we have a high amount of rain, but we definitely have rain and, you know, welcome it because we're farmers. Yeah. Um, we definitely noticed that it's getting hotter in the summers. Like we're getting warmer, hotter, drier summers, and then um, longer longer summers that go into fall. So we definitely are noticing climate change around here. So far it hasn't um, negatively affected our growing patterns, but we, mm-hmm. we do notice like when it's really hot in the summer, sometimes it will sunburn the fruit. So mm-hmm. that is one change that my grandparents didn't really have to deal with when they were farming. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about a typical day. I'm sure there's no such thing as a typical day, but like during the season, what do you focus on on a daily basis? Yeah, so I get up pretty early. Um, I'm naturally kind of an early riser, so I'm up between 4.15 and 4.30. Usually put on some like positive music, read something inspirational, do my quick books, I balance my my checkbook, and then Uh I actually go exercise every morning. Um, I'm a part of the cross, a CrossFit community in town and really supportive people. Okay. And I really, I really think um, lifting weights has been really important for my overall physical health and back health because I'm constantly lifting cases of wine or kegs of beer or kegs of cider or lifting compost. So exercise is the first thing I do. And then I get home after showering and then usually dive into whatever. So today um, we're doing some finishing touches on the brewery. So I helped with that. And then I checked in with our team there in the winter on an orchard. Every single tree has to receive a haircut or receive pruning. So I checked mm-hmm. in with my team doing that. And they're about halfway through the orchard. So gave them lots of kudos for that. And then I do all the small trees. So I, you know, checked in all my progress on that. Definitely got to kick that into gear. And then um, I checked in with my parents because I farm with them. They live here on the site, uh, okay. on, on the farm. And then my youngest brother is the cook in our restaurant. So making sure he has everything he needs today because it's President's Day weekend. So a lot of people come out to the farm mm. to try our beer, wine, and cider and enjoy our farm fresh pizzas. So I wanted to make sure he had all the ingredients he needed. So I don't know, I guess. I guess I have a lot of different kind of arenas where we, yeah, I fluctuate between, you know, actual getting my hands in the dirt and then checking on cider, you know, that we're making currently and yeah, just yeah, a lot of things. So you're more of the overarching, just um, orchest- orchestrator of everything and making sure that the processes that are you've set up in place are working. Yeah, definitely. I feel like. Almost my role is one of like a backup and a cheerleader and yeah. just making sure everybody has the tools they need to feel successful. And, um, you know, our mission is to weave together farming, fermentation, and hospitality. Okay. And we do that through a variety of ways. We, we grow a variety of fruits. We start with berries. We also have cherries, peaches, nectarines, plums, pluots. We grow um, apples, pears, quince, blueberries, grapes. And then with all of those fruits, a lot of those are sold farm direct right here in our farm stand. So okay. we, open up, we open up our farm like a huge living room and let people explore and pick fruit and take it home with them. And we do you know, a bunch of school tours because we feel really committed that everybody knows where their food comes from. Yeah. And has a farm experience and 
Um, so a lot of that fruit we sell direct or we sell, we, you know, we press and we turn it into either peach cider or blackberry cider. Um, you know, so we do that. And then we also have a huge open pavilion on the farm where we either host farm to table lunches or dinners, or sometimes people get married here as well. And that's been a nice little supplement for the expenses of the farm. It's a, a, it's kind of a side gig. It's not really our main gig, but it's a way to kind of, because people really like the idea of coming onto a farm and, mm-hmm. you know, having a farm to table experience. And it's kind of a really unique experience. There's no other to be on the land where the food is grown is a really special eating experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. So talk to us about the the fermentation side. When did you get started in that? Yeah, so my first um, experimentations with cider were, was in college. Uh, I remember going to a few different events and just hating everything that was served mm-hmm. and remembering kind of the farm fresh cider that my grandparents made. They immigrated here. From Switzerland and fell in love with the Hood River Valley because of Mount Hood and reminded them of the Alps and mm-hmm. just how fertile everything was. Um, so I remember buying my first gallon of non pasteurized apple cider, pitching the yeast and nutrient, shaking it up, and just kind of putting it under my dorm bed. Yeah. And all I can say is that the ciders have gotten significantly better from those <laughs> first batches. Yeah. We built. Um, a really small cidery. It's probably 10 by 14 with a drain field. And, and we started making, we got our, you know, FDA and our OLCC license for cider about four years ago. And we've been selling our small craft cider. It's called Golden Rose Cider. And it's a tribute to the hundred year old apple trees that are on the farm that we use to make the cider with. Mm-hmm. and um, we only sell it here on the farm. We, I don't know. I've, I've kind of been watching the trends with breweries and wineries and cideries, and it's a really kind of fine line and balance. If you grow too big and you distribute too much, you a lot of, you know, I don't know about where you're at, but a lot of the breweries here that kind of grew too big too fast are actually closing. Oh, wow. Because there's only there's only a certain amount of, you know, kegerator space for every brewery and you're competing against a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So I've made kind of a conscientious effort to sell our product right here on the farm, which also makes it really special because you can only have our cider that was like apples grown here, mm-hmm. harvested here, pressed here, fermented here on site. Same with our Mountain Dew Brewing and same with Great Bull Vineyards wines. Um, you can only get it here on the farm. And like I said, which is an intentional decision to not stress our production or try to you know, crush our distributing, but just keep it here so it's one of a kind and small craft. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It also helps you control the quality too. Like if you grow too big, you can't have a consistent product you know, over and over. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Because if you get too much, there's, you, well, I think too, you probably start going after less quality apples because you're just trying to bring up that production. Right. And like, as you're starting to see with our farm, it's not the only thing we do. Yeah. So for instance, we, we focus on pressing a lot of apples and in the winter season, because there's less farm work to do. Mm-hmm. So there's only, you know, so much apple cider we can make a year and we definitely bottle it. You can take growlers home. And so you can take it home with you, but like, for instance, it's not in every grocery store in town. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We've made, Absolutely. And then when people have asked to have it on tap at their place, we've politely declined because it's, we actually are wanting people to come have an experience on our farm that, you know, is not something that you can just experience anywhere. Mm-hmm. It's all about that agritourism now aspect and that just being like pulling people to the farm. Yeah. Like I do think there's more and more of a disconnect, you know, with more and more of the trends to like get your food in a box or get your food out of the freezer. There's less and less of a connection to 
where your food comes from and the people who grow your food and what's in what's in season right now and it's just a lot of confusion I think in our country with that and you know a lot of people say all the time like do the cherries come on in March and I'll say <laughs> no in Oregon in Oregon, our cherries, we start harvesting them around the 4th of July. Mm-hmm. And then that's kind of surprising because, you know, depending on where it's growing all over the world, you might be able to pick up cherries at the grocery store. But I think pe- more and more the people who have kind of rallied and championed our farm, they know now to come for tree ripened cherries around the 4th of July. And we have a huge crowd that comes and they pick our cherries till they're gone. Mm-hmm. And we can make cherry cider. We sometimes throw those cherries on pizza. We put them on salad. We make cherry gelato. So we try to take whatever we're growing and definitely create an experience for our guests so they know that it's cherry season. And it's something that's really special, and there's definitely a shelf life to it. And, you know, it's it's a fun thing to be a part. I mean, harvest is a really um, – you know, beautiful thing and abundant thing to be a part of. So inviting people into that experience is, can be, you know, kind of life changing because the cherries that you purchase maybe at the big box stores, they don't taste the same as the ones that you picked off the tree. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So let's talk about that more the agritourism. So you do the you pick, you do the weddings. Um, what other ways are you monetizing getting people onto your farm? I mean, again, you have the pizzas. Well, I mean, the thing we probably do the most of is educational tours. So we have a lot of school, you know, we don't charge schools to come onto our farm for tours. So we, I don't even know how many school tours we do a year. I I lose track. Um, Yeah. But the ones that come in the fall, they usually pick out a pumpkin too, out of our pumpkin patch. And they usually pick a few apples because a lot of them have never picked a piece of fruit off a tree before. Mm-hmm. Um, they go down to our barnyard and say hi to Carlos, the steer, and our chickens. And so, but we have kids come year round. Like we have some come in the spring. We have a few schools that kind of want to show their students, you know, the seasonality of farming and what a tree looks like in the winter and when it starts to look like when it's in blossom mm-hmm. and when it's like the tiny fruitlet stage and then when it's harvest time. And so, I guess education is probably a huge piece of our you know inviting people into an agricultural experience and then probably number two would be the kind of farm to table lunches dinners or coming and eating in our restaurant Mm -hmm. um, where you can enjoy what's in season and and if it's not all fruit and veggies from our farm like there's a veggie farm down the street sour farms and we get quite a few quite a bunch of our lettuce from them because we can't really keep up Okay. The amount of lettuce we grow, we, we we have to supplement it with other farms. And sometimes they also provide some of our um, basil and stuff like that for the margarita pizza. And so the restaurant is, you know, supports us. And then also we're able to kind of pull in other nearby farms as well and support them as well. Mm-hmm. And then probably number three would be like these private events, whether they're weddings or you know, milestones in people's lives where they rent out our space and they enjoy, you know, basically the farm to themselves. Yeah. And and then, um, I don't know, maybe number four. So because of our Swiss heritage, we have like a Swiss Edelweiss day where we serve Swiss food kind of around the Harvest Festival and um, we've been trying to do, we're, we're in a really rural area of mm-hmm. Oregon. So there's not a lot of different ethnic foods. So one of the things we've been trying to do at our restaurant is one of our chefs has a Chinese background. So we did this huge Chinese New Year party where we had food, you know, that his grandmother and mother taught him how to make. And it was a wild success. We had people coming onto the farm around the New Year. And it was a way to kind of connect, you know, his cultural family heritage. And then we have another uh, chef who's been doing a lot of Georgian food. So mm-hmm. like Kinkali dumplings and ketchup curry. And 
So it's a way for my chef team to be really creative and, you know, inv- like be able to put our farm fresh eggs on that. And, um, you know, we have a Indian curry night coming up. We have a Thai night. And so it's a way to kind of invite our little small town community into fresh eating Mm-hmm. Uh, to support the farms around us and our farm and then also give my team of like the, my dynamic team an outlet to do something special with food like to make really mm-hmm. heartfelt food that involves their cultural heritage and so that's something we do almost every week or we have some sort of event that we invite our community to and it's been so well received I mean our community backs us up so hard and that's been so meaningful because we can't be successful without if you're doing farm direct food you cannot be successful without your community believing in this idea that you got to back up your farmers Mm -hmm. so talk to us a little bit about the i think it's pavilion you put up um so that's where you have the weddings and these special events yeah (laughs) and family events like we celebrated my parents 50th anniversary there the other day and then this is kind of sweet. Our employees, our agricultural employees that farm with us, we let them use the space too. So if their kids are having like their first communion or their first quinceanera, they can use the pavilion too as a part of living here. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's this big gulang. Um, you can look it up under mountainvieworchardsweddings.com and it's this huge open beam. So you kind of feel like you're, kind of Swiss family Robinson style, like you're in the middle of the orchard, mm-hmm. but you're protected from the the heat. And then it, it points up south towards Mount Hood. Ah. And then also you can see straight ahead of you are, are like 125 year old apple trees that we use for our hard cider. So the whole legacy of our farm is just sort of, it's like, it's basically the heart of our farm is where we have this place where we do these farm to table events. And then we share it as well. So we, with nonprofits want to use it for a fundraiser. Like we let this farming nonprofit called the Gorge Grown Network have their harvest dinner in it every year. And we just share it with them. Or we've had um, people that are like fighting cancer. They'll have parties down there for their, for their chemo funds or, um, we've had like the Lions Club has come here before and we've had, you know, a variety of nonprofits. So we try to be a farm that gives back to as well as mm-hmm. as well as charging people for events. We have a lot of free events down there too that we let people use the, the farm so they can create an experience for, you know, the people that believe in their mission. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm on your Google Maps right now looking at a 3D or like a, a panoramic view of it. So it's really cool to be able to see that. Yeah, you might even be able to see the Hood River that flanks to the um, west side of our farm. Yeah. So we're in, the, we're in the upper Hood River Valley. So, you know, all over Hood River, there's orchards and veggie farms. And, you know, Hood River is also really known for its fermentation scene. So lots of wineries and breweries and cideries and even some small craft um hard alcohol. And that's one of my goals in the future is possibly to figure out how to do pear, peach, and apple brandy. Okay. And prim- yeah, primarily because we grow all those, we grow peaches, we grow pears, we grow apples, and it just makes sense to incorporate that someday. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So how did the weddings get started? Was it just someone asked and you decided, yeah, we can slap a price on that or? Yeah, so they started out incredibly erratic. <laughs> they were just they were just out in a field, and we'd like connect every electrical cord we had, and you know, pack water down there. And they were definitely like on the farm vibe. And the more we did like that, we just had guests, the customers of our farm. Like we had people coming and picking here for you know three or mm-hmm. four generations. Mm-hmm. So I think. You know, one one of them said, "Can we please get married here? Like, we feel a connection to your farm, and we'd love to get married here." And so we started out where we just put tables out in the field, and then definitely made some upgrades through the year. Like, eventually put in an area where we could serve refreshments easier, and we had a little cooking area and little dance floor. And 
but it's still very simple. Like we keep mm-hmm. it really, you know, it's not nothing too outrageous because like that's something we only do the months like June through September and we do as many like farm to table lunches down there as we do special events. So, okay. And candidly the lunches and the dinners that, you know, are four hours long are way, way easier and way more enjoyable. Um, over time, like the longer events that you're like noon to nine mm. that are kind of high pressure for instance, maybe a wedding, you know, those can be pretty exhausting. And so yeah. it's something we do. We have so many really sweet couples that find our farm and, you know, come back every year for an anniversary picnic. But it's like something we keep kind of on the small end. We don't do a ton of weddings because yeah, it's just, it's just so consuming of our time. Yeah. So speak to that a little bit. What would you say to someone who's just getting started or interested in doing some on-farm events? What kind of like, are there any like top tips that you would recommend they start with? Oh, well, how I, how I incorporate all of my new ideas is I am the type of person that I love to to find out who's doing it already. And just yeah. like, if I can you know, research with them, what's, what, what's going well, what's not going well, what would you do differently? And so I definitely have some mentors along the way um, with weddings and, and farm to table events. I reached out to Brady Jacobson at Mount Hood Organics and okay. she, she and her husband, John Farm, a couple miles away. And she had been doing weddings and different events. I don't know for 15, 20 years. And so oh, wow. she was kind she was kind enough to meet with me and kind of like a midwife talk me through, <laughs> you know, our first tour of events. And then I've actually tried to pass along to other farms who, you know, in the spirit of trying to sustain and not lose their farm, they they mm-hmm. started events. And I've had them that with them and given them feedback and ideas and and you know that's something i'd be willing to do for anybody listening to the podcast too they they can email me and reach out and i'd happily share any of you know the pearls that we've learned along the way because i'm really committed to small family farms staying in the family and not Mm -hmm. having to be sold to bigger corporations and sometimes that means doing a variety of things to kind of keep your bills paid and your lights on and to, you know, pay your people a living wage. Mm -hmm. So um, again, if anybody wants to find me online, they're welcome to email me and I'd happily share what we've been doing to kind of, you know, save the farm basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll put your contact information in the show notes so people can grab that when they just go to the thriving farmer podcast.com. Yeah, I'm all about community over competition. And like, we all rise when we all rise. And like, farmers got to help farmers, because Mm -hmm. honestly, like, all the farms around my farm are owned by people who are like in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. There's a guy who farms nearby us that's in his 90s. And so I don't know who's going to buy those farms. The land is very expensive because it's so beautiful in the Hood River Valley. Mm. So I'm always like talking to people all the time, like you should come out and farm or like people yeah. are just kind of itching, itching for something more meaningful in their life. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm always like, yeah, there's farm, there's going to be farmland coming up for sale out here. But then the first thing they say is, oh, but can, you know, can we pay our bills and will the farm? And, and I'm really honest. I say, you know, sometimes you got to mix it up. You no, know? sometimes you got to do different things because. Yeah. And then me personally, I actually love the, you know, variety. Like it's kind of nice to do something for, you know, three hours over here and then go inside and do this. Or if it's like a total rainy day, it's nice to go into the cidery and just like bottle cider or go over to the brewery or, you know, the winery. It's nice to have a variety of things you can do. So you're not shut down if it snows or something. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So talk to me about a little bit about that. What is the price of land out there per acre? Oh my gosh. I think the, my neighbor to the north of me is selling his farm for 3.5 million. Oh, wow. 
And it's gorgeous. Yeah. It's a gorgeous piece of property and beautiful home. And I'm just saying it's, it's, it's high value land out here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's when, I mean, and then candidly, you got to have some income because nowadays it's really hard to get a bank to loan to you. I, that's been my experience. Other people might have a different one, but the way I've gotten my loans on the farm to do like add these buildings and convert this barn into the cidery and convert this section into the brewery and build a tasting room, build a restaurant. I've gotten those loans based on my nurse practitioner income, not on the farm. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of wisdom. If you really have it in your heart to farm and you want to kind of have some capital so you can diversify, you might have to have an off the farm job that basically helps you look more attractive to banks. Yeah. And then after you feel like you've done your infrastructure, maybe you can drop that. Yeah. I'm down to like one to two days a week in the clinic. Um, but, you know, I really feel committed to, I mean, I have a huge heart for social justice. So I feel a huge commitment to serving people who are, mm -hmm. you know, down on their luck inside our county jail. And it's also a form of nurture. And, you know, farming is a big part of nurturing your trees. And so it's not, I don't really feel like they're competing jobs. Every yeah. once in a while during harvest, I feel like, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe I'm going into the clinic right now. It makes no sense for me to be leaving the farm. But then, like, this month, in February, we're not planning anything. You know, it makes total sense for me to be working in the clinic in the yeah, winter. Absolutely. So talk to us about Carlos, because I saw on your website, I believe you've actually, oh, he's got a, a line of merchandise and all sorts of things. Oh, Carlos. So he's the mascot of our farm. He's a Texas Longhorn. He's got huge, you know, horns and then he's got yeah. these cute little black spots all over him you can go online and find him and he's actually um kind of on all of our branding for our brewery okay the, 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 our brewery tag is farm fresh beer no bowl okay <laughs> and that's yep. because of Car carlos the steer um so yeah he my mom actually picked him up he's 19 years old and she got him kind of a rescue like there was a mm -hmm. farmer about a mile away who was growing them, but you know cattle so up and down the market and you know sometimes you, sometimes you just never know like cattle if you're making money or losing money but um she she got carlos and he's been such a hit i mean everybody we have random people come from all over the world to meet carlos because they want to meet the the you know the mascot of our farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at the pictures here, and uh, there's lots of customer pictures with him, so that's cool. I'm also oh, seeing yeah. all the flower pictures. So you do some dahlias, and and are those you pick or? Yeah, so we have sunflowers and lavender and clover and a variety of dahlias, and you know we just added those. We added more of a flower component about four years ago and that was because we had customers requesting more you pick mm -hmm. and um and then weddings so when you come here and get married you can go over and you know we just sell them for a wholesale rate so you can get you know 100 dahlias for like 50 dollars like really inexpensive uh -huh. and um or you can get a bunch of sunflowers to add so a lot of people I guess I was, I'm always trying to think about how each thing that we do on the farm benefits another aspect of the farm or another business. So the flower piece, it's great in the farm stand. People love to come out and get flowers for their tables or sometimes people um, will come and, you know, pick up a bouquet for somebody who's grieving. And then the brides and the grooms or the brides and the brides and the grooms, and the grooms they'll pick them out too. Yeah. for their weddings and then we use them you know on the table whenever we do a farm to field dinner we we use our flowers yeah on the table so and then some of them are edible and you can actually put little petals of flowers on salads or on the pizza 
Um, we've done a lavender gelato before, a lavender blueberry gelato. So we try to mm. kind of incorporate all the flowers. Like we've been experimenting with a lavender cider. So there's okay. a lot of stuff that we, we do with the flowers as well. Very interesting. Talk to me a little bit more about um, the business side, because I know with the business side, there's always endless tasks to be done. How do you make sure you focus on the highest priority things every day? Well, that's a good question. Um, Part of it is kind of just learning the rhythm of the seasons. Mm -hmm. So we're in the winter, and I know that in the winter, we really got to prioritize you know, getting cider made, getting cider keg, getting cider bottled. Um, they're in like the last week of the brewery construction. And then we're having our brewery release. If you're in Oregon, come to our beer release on March 21st, 2020 on the farm. Um, so I'm trying to push to get them done mm-hmm. so we can actually be ready for our beer release. And then I check in with my main foreman every Monday. And we do kind of an inventory on where we at with the pruning. And then he let me know that we need another battery for one of our forklifts. So my dad, he's 75. He loves to kind of do little errands. So he Mm -hmm. hopped in the car this morning and he's going to go get my battery for the, um, the heister. And then my mom, she, nothing makes her happier than to kind of factor. So I think she's, cutting brush right now so we kind of we cut the little pieces of the pruned um like apple or pear um shoots into the ground so it just composts into the ground so she's working on that so like shredding them with a shredder and then i check in with my brother and see what he needs if we need to pick anything up or if we need to pull anything out of our cold storage like apples or pears Mm -hmm. um we have a bunch of tours this afternoon where people are wanting to come see the pavilion. We have sometimes travel groups come and they bring, you know, it's President's Day weekend. So if you yeah. own a wine, winery, these three day weekends are really popular for people to come out to your vineyard and try wine. So it's been mm-hmm. a very busy weekend. And so I, that was kind of what I've done so far today. And then now I'm talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> So um, talk to me about the, the apple growing out there because that you guys actually have a very ideal climate for fruit, correct? Yeah, yeah. Apples and pears grow really well, or quince. All the palm fruits, right? They grow yeah. really well out here. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I mean, I know that they grow well in Michigan and New York too, that, that we're not the only ones. That, but, you know, this is a really special little area because of that microclimate, the soil, mm-hmm. and the ample irrigation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it kind of just all so, three coesque together. Yeah. So, I, and then it's not too warm. So, you know, that we don't in the sun. We go over 120 different types of apples, and some of those are cider apples, so those are the ones with more of the phenolics and, you know, more of an interesting texture, mm-hmm. a different tasting cider. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we grow about 20 different varieties of pears. We grow about six different varieties of quince, and then we have about 12 different varieties of peaches. So we, we have a, a lot of different varieties of different um types of fruit and that's done pretty intentionally you know number one we have a farm stand so people sometimes want to pick honey crisp other people really want to pick you know granny smith or they really want to pick um you know an older like gravenstein apple and that's the apple that they always use for their pie so we try to have a variety of fruit in the orchard and um we we diversify more and more. Like this year, I'm pl- planting Gamay Noir grapes, okay. just for a different different red varietal. And then I planted a bunch of Kingston Black apples for just a different flavor profile with our cider. Um, our customers really enjoy the uh, Comis and the Concord pear, so I have a few more of those coming this year because we keep selling out of those. Mm-hmm. Um, I always get a few replacements of our blueberry plants or, 
Um, I always put in a few more strawberries every year. And so we're just trying to like every year we, we, you know, springtime, you know, we're, we're coming into springtime here and that's like the most ho- hopeful time on a farm, right? Cause you're, you're planting and you're kind of like trying to, you know, yeah. forecast heart for the harvest. So one of the things that's kind of fun too around springtime is we, back in the day, like when my grandparents would plant trees, they'd always plant like a cash crop right next to the pears since okay. pears take eight, since pears take eight to 10 years to be at full harvest. So sometimes they'd plant asparagus right next to it, or they'd plant strawberries or okay. just something that they could harvest that next year. So all, all over our farm in the spring, all this wild asparagus comes up. Oh, that's and so fun. Yeah, we don't, we don't spray um, Roundup here, so we have a bunch of morel mushrooms that pop up as well, and we have all these wild strawberries. And so springtime is like hidden treasure coming out oh, yeah. on the farm. So it's a, and then the blossoms, and then we um, have bees that we keep with our um, cousins. So then the bees come back during uh-huh. the hardest working girls on the farm are the bees. And they come back usually the end of April and do all our, all of our pollinating because a lot of our crop is pollinated by bees. Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah. So okay. that's something you said interesting that the Roundup prevents the morels from coming? I don't know if that's actually true because I know they grow on farms that, you know, do spray. But we we just made a conscientious effort to try to manage weeds a different way uh-huh. and not to be political, but just because we have so many people coming onto our farm. Uh-huh. And then we live here. This is where we live. Yeah. So we just wanted to um, just feel good about everything that goes onto the ground. And we're right by the river, too. So yeah. we just kind of made an effort. We just made, made a conscientious effort to try to figure out alternative ways to kind of manage our weeds, and yeah. which we grow plenty of. Like, oh, yeah. It one, can't be easy. The number one thing. The number one thing we grow on the farm is grass that we don't really want everywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you talked about, you know, a couple mentors being um, those neighboring farmers. Who else would you say mentored you as you kind of stepped into this operation? Oh, definitely my parents. I mean, Mm -hmm. they, I have more and more respect for them every year that they've been farmers for like 45 years here because there's just so many ups and downs. Like you can grow this perfect product and then depending on what's going on in the world economically or trade agreements or, Uh you know, it's just, it's just so vulnerable to be a farmer and, and they're so hopeful. And every year, I mean, they're, they're both like doing whatever it takes to kind of help me and my younger brother succeed here on the farm. And, and then my grandparents, I mean, my, my grandfather was, and my grandmother, they used to have these, you know, they were doing farm to table dinners before they even had a name. Mm-hmm. And on Sunday, they invite, you know, the whole community over practically and buy like a local salmon and everybody would just make salads from what was going on their farm. And just the, the gathering aspect and the hospitality aspect uh-huh. and um, the importance of like sharing food together and breaking bread and slow cooked food and just the whole, my whole European roots and, and how committed they were to growing food. And um, I mean, that really shaped and influenced the vision here on the farm. Um, uh-huh. I mean, I kind of feel like what I'm doing is a tribute to them and just, you know, their <laughs> grandfather's different random batches of alcohol that he made and, you know, <laughs> my, <laughs> you know, and just um, all the canning and jam making and pie making and just all the ways my grandmother, you know, enjoyed our harvests and, uh-huh. um, there's just uh, so many warm, special memories of growing up in a farming family and wanting to kind of carry that on and then invite the community into that experience because it's life changing. If you really, if you really like enjoy tomatoes off a of vine, you know, with peaches as well and basil that was made on the farm, you know, 
and brought together in this meal. I mean, there's nothing like it. There's you just can't recreate it. You know, sitting in like the city with like the cement sidewalks. It's just so much different experienced on the farm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So talk to me a little bit about coming back to the farm. Was that a little bit, uh, were you apprehensive at all? Was that hard to, you know, taking that step? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I was living in Northeast Portland. I had a little home there and a really dynamic community and everywhere I lived, everywhere I went was walkable or I could ride my bike and it was all Uh flat and there was like a Whole Foods down the street and post office was over here and the library was right there. And my clinic that I worked at was walkable. And, and then finally had enough money to buy the farm. My parents were 70. They were kind of wanting to slow down. And that first summer, I remember my cell phone didn't really work out here. So I was like missing calls all the time. And I was already feeling kind of isolated. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not married so I was already kind of like feeling like oh my gosh what did I do I left my whole community in Portland and now I'm here on a super small farm with like my 70 year old parents and then everywhere I tried to ride my bike it's like uphill because I'm up in the country I'm like the flatlander had to become mountain mama on the bike and (laughs) everywhere I was going I was like oh my gosh it's so hard to ride my bike around here and um, I would walk a lot the farm in in the evening and just kind of kind of praying for the trees and praying for ideas because I was looking at the books. I was looking at my parents' books and I just remember thinking, this isn't going to work. Like mm. we're not going to make it with the farm and the fruit stand. Like we're going to have to ramp up the diversification like times 10 or we're going to have to put the farm for sale. Mm -hmm. And I know my parents had kind of fought to keep the farm. You know, there was definitely lean years. And um, so then all this creative, creative ideas started coming to me at night. So even though I felt a little isolated and I did feel a little out on a limb and I, I did kind of wonder why I had jumped all these kind of new ideas started coming to me about, okay, we could put this here and we could start doing this. And, and this would be a great area for a pumpkin patch and we could start doing, you know, lavender over here. And so then I kind of channeled that kind of isolating, lonely kind of, what did I, what have I done vibe into um, just like hopeful belief that we're going to make it on the farm. Like we're going to, do whatever it takes to to beat you know this idea that small family farms are going to get bought up and so then it was just kind of this like mission or I don't know I just felt a lot of I have a lot of drive in general like I'm I'm usually like first one up the last one to bed yeah so I just kind of just kept focusing on that and then I gotta be honest with you at first not my mom. She was very much on board with all the diversification, but my dad was like very concerned because sometimes trees would have to come out in certain areas so we could yeah. plant, you know, cider apples or we could plant strawberries or we could plant dahlias. And so all the change at first on the farm, he was supportive, but we definitely had some kind of heart to heart. So he was like, you know explain to me economically how this is going to be better than what we're doing and Mm -hmm. he definitely kind of made me do the math to show him and I was definitely annoyed by that because I was like almost 40 years old and I'm like showing my dad my math (laughs) but to flip the coin over he helped me come up with a business plan and helped me figure Mm -hmm. out so it ended up being a win-win it was just kind of hard because I wasn't used to having to explain myself to anybody. Yeah. So. yeah. But I'm sure that also put a level of a checking to that, to just double check those numbers and say, yes, we are going to make this work. And it probably gave you more confidence after you were able to convince him. Did it make the bank meetings easier? Well, yeah, definitely. You know, I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of pioneers in this valley that have already kind of proven that like brewing and cideries and wineries are doing well. And then, 
you know, people just kind of want to come out onto the farm and sip and relax. So it, it hasn't been hard to get people to come out to enjoy what we're fermenting. Yeah. But trying to get the permitting, you know, that's a big part of it too. Like if anybody wants to email me, trying to get, go through all the hoops to get your permitting is kind of a huge leap. Like, mm-hmm. you know, in our, in our country, you have to basically get your county to, you know, sign off on everything. So you have to, um, you basically have to, in the same way that I had to explain it to my dad, I had to explain it to our local governing bodies that, you know, this is actually going to save my family's farm. And then we're going to use like half of our pizzas in peach beer and then peach cider. And it's, you know, it decreases food waste and it also kind of creates this unique drink that people can try and, you know, small craft. And I've employed all these you know, local people, most of the people that work in the restaurant that I have live less than a mile away. Like some of them walk to work. And when you're out in the country to, to get a job where people believe in a living wage, sometimes you have to drive 45 minutes or an hour to get to a place that, you know, you believe in their mission and you feel like you're being paid well. And I've had so many of my employees thank me because they just live down the street and they can just they're here in a heartbeat. They can go home and let their dog out for lunch or, you know what I mean? So it's uh-huh. like, it's, it's not only just a win for us. It's like a win for the people that have partnered with me. And I can't say enough nice things about my parents and how they just pour out volunteer so many hours for me on the farm and have just been such forces of like um, encouragement and help. And then, I've got this team that I I just can't say enough nice things about them as well. Like they've just like believed in this mission and carried it. And there's a few times this summer we definitely fell in over our head. Like we had like an hour wait on pizzas and we were like going out and picking basil as fast as we could or picking whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. We just had never run a restaurant before. I mean, I'm a nurse practitioner turned farmer who's never owned a restaurant and as soon as the word got out that we had these farm fresh pizzas I mean we just had the whole I felt like the whole city was coming out on the weekend and which was wonderful because lord knows we had huge debts to pay yeah but also we just had no idea how to plan ahead for how much how many peaches to have in the restaurant like how many like our peach pizza we just like, we put it on and we're like, okay, now we have our peach pizza on. And it just like, before we knew it, we'd like gone through every peach, like in an hour. And then we had to go out and get more peaches. And that was, it was just a really steep learning curve. Like mm-hmm. not, not complaining by any means, but we just were learning how to stock a kitchen and how to, yeah. to do the whole aspect of hospitality. We had to learn hospitality in front of the whole world this summer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. With that, I'd like to ta- stop here and take a quick break. In a minute, we'll be back with Trina from Mount View Orchards in Mount Hood, Oregon. If you've been enjoying this episode so far, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer. It includes resources such as our 10 winter growing secrets we wish we knew when we started, which is a ebook which talks about the tips and techniques to get better growth in your winter production. We teach things like the simple but counterintuitive principle that trips up most beginning growers, the shape and size of tunnels that are best for winter production, how to prepare beds so they are weed free and get beautiful lush stands of crops, what to do about pests like aphids, voles, and slugs, how to fast track your research to fine tune your production for your microclimate, and how to pack in more crops for higher yields and profits. So head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. All right, we are back with Trina from Mountain View Orchards. So talk to us about your team. You just mentioned them. How do you divide roles on the farm? Oh, yeah. Well, I guess we try to pay attention to what people's passions are and giftings. And 
Um, so, for instance, we definitely have people who just feel really knowledgeable in pruning and thinning and harvesting the big, you know, 100-year-old trees. So we definitely keep them in their, you know, Mm -hmm. source where they feel the strongest and then people that are like great at baking and you know do good at our you know we have a bunch of baked goods and like apple cider donuts in our farm stand so people that are kind of in that bent or you know canning we do a bunch of our own jam making and we try to sell pies and different things so those people are kind of in that bent and then um we definitely have kind of our flower team and grapes you know Vineyards are a little bit different to manage than orchards. Um, and then Javi, kind of our main foreman, he he's sort of in charge of the barnyard, barnyard and the chickens. And sometimes we get a couple pigs every year. And on payday in the winter, I used to give out a couple of packages of pork and tip my, my guys in pork because they love that. That's like mm-hmm. their love language is if I give him a couple packages of meat and, and then also we have, we can fruit finish the pigs because we have any extra fruit. We just take down to our animals. Um, and I think, I, I think that's the bulk. We do. I have a brewer that helps with beer and he also helps me take the cider. Uh, we're probably going to be hiring a few more people in fermentation. And then right now my cousin, he makes our wine and bottles our wine. Um, and so definitely there's a lot of family members here, but also people that feel like family. Like some of our ag workers have worked here before I was born. We have like four generations of the same family mm-hmm. that has been working here and partnering in ag and, you know, are committed to farming. And so, you know, that's just sort of mind blowing to me that, you know, that, mm-hmm grandfather and then his kids and then their kids and now their kids and um so that's something that's really cool Mm -hmm. so for some of these more specialized roles do you just hire across a wide range or still try to pull that from your community oh definitely like um local is best so i try to hire people that live in town and Mm -hmm. um if not like you know in a five mile radius if possible, you know, I'm not sure how it works in all the farms listening, but we have quite a bit of agricultural farming labor. So camps here. So we have like double wides that our main employees live in Mm. here year round. And then I, I cover all their housing and all their utilities. And that's part of their, you know, the gift of living here. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then my restaurant kind of employees, most of them don't live here. They they live nearby. So, um, but most of them are, live real close, just down the road. So, gotcha. So everyone I is quite here. local. Yeah, I live here on the farm. Instead of my parents, I have a little home that I built. Um, like it's not even 500 square feet, so it's very small. And then my parents kind of live in their main house that they built back when they were in their thirties. So. Gotcha. So if there was a magic reset button as it relates to starting the farm or when, in your case, just coming onto the farm, what systems would you go rather back and put into place sooner? Hmm. Well, I honestly feel really lucky and grateful because most of the stuff that we've hoped to do and thought to do has just sort of the doors have opened and we've been able to walk through them. I'm not really sure if I can think of one thing that we could have done differently or wished would have gone. One thing, I'll I'll tell you one thing that wasn't quite a win. Um, We started an all fruit CSA when I first got onto the farm and we had, we, we sold about 50 shares and we had like 30 boxes going into Portland, which is about an hour and a half from the farm. We had like 10 boxes going over to, on the other side of Mount Hood and Sandy. We had um, 10 boxes going to Hood River, the Dalles area. So we pack all we pack up all the fruit up in the morning, like for 16 weeks on a Monday, and then 
we drive the fruit into the city and all over. And we ended up doing that for a couple of years. But um, the reason why I eventually um, kind of let it go and didn't promote it is it sort of was the opposite of the mission that I was trying to create here. I, you know, I feel really committed to inviting people onto the farm to enjoy the harvest of the farm. And the more time I spend in like parking lots doing like um, farmers markets Mm -hmm. and doing um, CSAs where I drive the fruit to them, the less time people in the city come and visit small family farms. So I had to make the decision if that business, which was successful, it wasn't like hurting us financially, mm-hmm. but if that was in, if that was a mission on what I was trying to do here. So I eventually wrote an email out to the few like farmers markets we were going to and to the CSA people and said, you know, after, you know, a lot of thought and prayer, I actually think we're going to be canceling our CSA and canceling a lot of our markets because we would really like to encourage you to come experience our harvest here and uh-huh. leave the city and come towards us. And for the most part, you know, our customers are like, yeah, we get it. We, you know, and we love visiting your farm, no problem. Uh-huh. But, you know, we definitely, have, we definitely had a few people that were like, Hey, you know, we, <laughs> We we don't have time to come to your farm and you know, we're busy people in the city. And I and I get that too. I mean, there's seasons of your life where you don't have an hour to get in your car and go to a farm. But that was one thing that I eventually let go because it just wasn't on mission. It wasn't what I was trying to do. And even like Hood River, like the local farmers market here is always like, Will you come set up a booth and serve you know, cherries and peaches and nectarines. And, and I've just politely declined. And I said, you know, 20 minutes from your market is this farm where you can, you can pick nectarines off the tree. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing like that. I mean, there's nothing like walking through a peach grove where all the peaches are ripe. It just like knocks you out. The smell is so sweet and intense. And I'm like, nobody gets that in a, in a, in a parking lot. Nobody's going to get that same experience. So I'm supportive of farmers who go to parking lots, and I'm supportive of CSAs. I actually think they're genius because it's a way of getting the community to support you and to, you know, invest in your farm that year. And, like, those spring checks were wonderful, right? So there's not a lot of money coming in in the spring. Mm -hmm. It's like all expense and no money. So I get – I understand the CSA model, and I think it's brilliant. It's just not for us. We've just decided against it because we want to invite more farm experiences. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I actually applaud you for that because there's so many people which are like, you know, I'm a farmer, I just grow stuff. And I actually will come back and say, actually, as a farmer, part of your role is to educate the community. And if we don't educate, they will never buy from us. Or like, why should they buy? I think a lot of people, once you explain to them why, it matters for them to know the family that grows your food or what, why it matters is, um, you know, more and more farms, if we go around our country are getting turned into housing development and more and more people are coming to our area and buying like the 10 acre lots or the five acre lots for their second home. And then just kind of letting the blueberries go or just kind of letting the, whatever, was being grown in this amazing soil. They were, they just kind of let it go. And then, yeah. so instead of this valley growing like food for the whole world and like feeding the hungry, now it's just about Mount Hood and it's just about the beauty. And yeah. So I feel really committed to keeping small family farms as farms, but I also feel like there has to be some, ability for those small family farms to, you know, diversify and do other stuff. There's kind of like a few camps in our community where some people are like, no, you can't do any, you know, you don't want, we don't want you to invite people onto your farm and Mm -hmm. we don't want you to do tours and we don't want you to do dinners and we don't want you to do 
And then there's other people that are like, the more tours, the better, you know, the more dinners, the better. The Yeah. So I understand that there's a few schools of thought and that in farming, there is sort of a solidary a life that people don't want a ton of people coming on their farm. And I get that too. Mm-hmm. But for us, this is what we've had to do. This is what I've had to do to keep my people employed and like help my parents retire and, um, you know, employ people down the road. And it's not just about me. It's about like this whole community now. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So let's talk about promotion. What seems to work well for you? I see you're on Instagram, Facebook. How do you bring new people into your world? Well, we definitely have people who follow us online and we have a lot of supportive, like, but I think it's the relationship. Like, so it's the relationships we built. Like, uh-huh. why do you have four generations of the same family coming and picking apples here every year? And then their daughter wants to get married here. And because they, they feel a connection to my parents or they feel a connection to me or so whenever we have these dinners where we're serving, like, let's say we're doing like a stone fruit harvest dinner where we're, we're doing peaches and nectarines and plums mainly for the meal. Um, I always do a tour. I always walk people out into the orchard and, you know, say hey so this is a little bit about us and here's a little bit about our trees and this is what this is why we farm and this is the mission of our farm farming fermentation hospitality and and then I thank them for like backing up our farm and making the commitment to come to this dinner and you know supporting small family farms and and that's how you get a lifetime customer because Uh they actually now feel like they're a part of the mission. Like, oh yeah, we go to that farm because, you know, we went to a dinner one time and now we come and get our peaches here every year because, and we know why she's not in the, in the parking lot. We know that she wants us to come pick peaches. And so it's like telling your story, whether it's through social media, whether it's in person, whether it's through the school tours, sometimes I blog, um, like making time to do these podcasts, even though it's like beautiful outside today. It's like a perfect farming day. Yes. Because telling the story of your farm matters. And if you want people to feel a connection and to back you up, they need to know you. They need to know, you know what I mean? They need to know your farming story. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Talk to us about beginning farmers, because I'm sure you see some growing around you, or you meet some and buy some. What is the biggest mistake you see them making? Hmm. Well, I had a farmer come up to me this summer. She had picked a bunch of um, blueberries, and I think she was going to freeze some, and and she had a little lot that she started, and she said something to me about she said, I'm really hoping to get to the point where I can just farm. She said that to me. And she goes, like, you. <laughs> and I go, yeah. I go, I got to be honest with you. I still work as a nurse practitioner. And I still, you know, so there's this misconception that if you're successful in farming, you're only farming and you're making enough money to pay all your bills and to buy your land and to buy all your seed and your trees every year. And I actually think that's a misnomer. I, my grandparents and my parents always have worked a little bit off the farm and there was definitely kind of a bivocational aspect of farming. Okay. And I think ultimately my parents were farming, right? Once they got their land paid for and they were able to kind of, buy all the equipment they needed they figured out a way economically to make it happen just here on the farm but as I'm buying this land and as I'm buying like you know tanks for the brewery I have to work off the farm and I don't necessarily think that means I'm unsuccessful at farming or that I'm I haven't quite made it I think the misnomer that young farmers have is that 
that it should only look a certain way. And I propose it looks a variety of ways. And um, whether you're partnered or married or single, you have to figure out a way to economically make ends meet. So I think there needs to be, um, I guess, more of a graciousness to, oh, that's awesome that, you know, you still, you know, teach or substitute in the summer or in the winter as farm in the winter mm-hmm. or, excuse me, in the summer. Or, that's awesome that you, you know, still working as a nurse or you're still, you know what I mean? Like, just kind of create more of an open attitude around what it looks like to be successful and not to kind of pigeonhole that it only has to be, you know, a small family farm only making money off the farm because that's just, I don't even think that's economically, especially in my community with the price of land, you just can't make it. Yeah. The the land is just so expensive. You're never going to be able to afford it with the current price of food. Right. So then there has to be this attitude of like, this is worthwhile work that, you know, growing food for your community is meaningful and matters. So if you have to work a little off your farm to make ends meet, then that's part of your story. That's part of the farming story. And that's part of gritting it out, mm-hmm. you know, embracing the work. So someday you can own the land. And then maybe someday when I have everything paid off, you know, I, I might not work as many hours off the farm, but right now it's mandatory. It's not yeah. an option. Yeah, absolutely. So what encouragement would you go back and give to your new farmer self, you know, after those, that first year? Hmm. I wish I would have started inviting people over for Sunday supper earlier because I I think that that first summer me was a little lonely. And as soon as we started doing more intentional meals with farmers in the area and people would, Oh, I just started to feel that sense of community and connection. And like, this is like, I'm not in it alone. I'm doing it with these other people. So I think Sunday suppers or, wish we would have got that going a little earlier and then um I don't know maybe take taking a class or two on social media mm-hmm. I felt I felt I took a small business class when I first started from the there's a lot of community colleges offer like a small business um class yeah. that you can take I took that that was really good because it kind of helped me define my mission and all of that so I guess take classes, um, learn, you know, also hire your weaknesses. Like there's a few things I'm just not that great at. So I always hire people. I don't know anything about web design or, so I always hire people to do my branding and web design. And then I can go do something I really love and I'm Mm -hmm. passionate about. So like know your weaknesses, hire them out know your strengths, pour all your passion into that. It doesn't matter if you're not good at something. There are other people in the community that can do it. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. you know, move on. Yeah. Don't try to do it all because then you have like, you have something that's less attractive because that's not your strength. Yeah. So, yeah. And you're doing a worse job at growing the produce or the product that you are because you just can't devote time to it. Yeah. Like, so... I feel pretty passionate about hard cider. So I put a lot of energy into that, but my cousin's like excellent at wine. So of course he should be doing wine and I don't have to be Mm -hmm. doing everything. And then, you know, we hired a brewer so we could do peach beers, sour cherry beers. So we could do um, a variety of kind of fruit beers. And, but I don't have to feel like I have to do that too, or learn that skill too. That's somebody I'm going to hire to do that. And then I'm working on, branding right now with you know the graphic designer who's helped me with all my branding and so it's like stay stay in your most strong lane and then everybody else like bring them into your dream and and that's Uh okay like you don't have Uh to be good I think there is sort of this aspect in farming where you're supposed to be able to get under the tractor and fix the tractor and then you're supposed to be able to go sell the fruit here and it's like sometimes you actually need it a team to do all that and you don't have to do it all yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that is so key for people to hear. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, if I did the branding, it would be so simple. It just wouldn't, 
I want it to be as excellent as like the fruit that we make. So it's like hire the person who's excellent at that job. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? No. Hmm. Well, gosh, I'm not the type of person who can pick one. I mean, that pocket knife comes out the most. I mean, I'm I'm constantly reaching into my pocket and pulling out my pocket knife Mm -hmm. for a thousand different reasons. So if you're a farmer, like if you know, if you want to get a gift for a farmer, get them a cool looking pocket knife. (laughs) And they'll love you forever. What kind of pocket knife do you have? I have a Gerber. Um, Okay. Is it like a multi-tool or? Huh? Is it a multi-tool? Oh God, I don't know. Or is it, it just a single old. blade? It just like, a sing- I think it was, I think it was my grand, uh, my grandfather. And okay. So it's got a story to it, but they, the pocket knife is something I probably use the most. But there's a mm-hmm. lot of tools on this farm because we harvest a variety of things. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So where but can the pe- pocket knife has the story? I mean, the story of farming is because it was not mine. It, it carries the legacy of the farm because it was my grandfather, so it's meaningful to carry it. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So Trina, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you spending this with us. Where can people find out more about you and your work? Yeah. So again, we're found online, mountaintheorchards.com. That's mountain spelled M-T. And it's called that because we're at the base of Mount Hood. And then if you ever want to visit our farm to table restaurant, it's called the Grateful Vineyards. And Gratitude has been an anchor of mine to kind of combat the stress and the uncertainty of farming. So that's why it's called the Grateful Vineyard. And um, you'll find every other little aspect of the business on those websites. So we like, we have like you know, information about cider or flowers or dinners, if you want to join a meal or, but our, you know, our restaurants open year round, seven days a week. So if you're in Oregon and you're, you want to come, you know, see what we're doing, come on out. We're open. You know, I think we're, we're closed on like the major holidays, like Christmas yeah. and stuff, but we're pretty much open year round. So come on out and see what we're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to definitely. Yeah. In fact, I'd happily yeah. give anybody a tour of, you know, our cidery, our brewery, where we make wine or if somebody wants to see what we're doing, come on over. I'm all about showing people what we're doing and so they can do it too. Mm-hmm. Well, we really appreciate your time and just your generosity with, uh, yeah, sharing that because that is, you're right. There's so much to learn with farming that you can't, and the medium we're on too is a podcast. So we can tell the story, but you can't see how it's done. So, Well, and that's my mission, right? Like, well, come on, mm-hmm. and come out and see what we're doing. Like, come taste and see what we're doing. Because this model, I think, could work in a lot of different farms, but you just got to see it. It's like you got to have a vision so you can walk towards it, or you can't just start it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you again so much for your time, Trina. Yeah, and and you as well. Honored to, you know, represent small family farms out here in Oregon. So thanks for asking me to share. Absolutely. And that's a wrap with Katrina. All right. So next week on the summit, we are going to have Terry Durham, who is the, like some people would say, the father of elderberries in the U.S. He spent a number of years um, advocating for elderberries grown in the U.S. as they're a better quality elderberry than the ones coming from Europe. And so you will hear him talk about the history of the elderberry in the U.S. You hear him talk about the co-op that they've developed to help farmers, how much you can make per acre with elderberries. And you will hear him talk about some of the machinery that he's developed to help um, process elderberries. So join me next week on the Thriving Farmers Summit and listen to Terry talk elderberries. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.